आई एम वेरी ग्लैड यू आर लाइकिंग शेयरिंग एंड सब्सक्राइबिंग माई चैनल सो प्लीज लाइक शेयर एंड सब्सक्राइब दिस स्टडी विथ मास्टर नोट्स एंड पुस द बेल आइकन सो दैट यू विल गेट द अर्लीस्ट नोटिफिकेशन अबाउट माई वीडियो सो टूडे आई विल स्टार्ट एम एच सिक्स ब्लॉक फाइव यूनिट थ्री दैट इज द टेक्स टू इमिली डिकिनसन ऑलरेडी आई हैव डिस्कस यूनिट यूनिट टू द टेस्ट वन वर्ल्ड ट्विटमैन द सॉन्ग ऑफ माई सेल्फ क्रॉसिंग ब्रुकलिन फेरी वेन लिलाक्स लास्ट इन द डोर एड ब्लूट सो टूडे आई विल कवर द टेक्स टू इमिली डिकिनसन सो प्लीज टिम टू माई वीडियो एंड वॉच द वीडियो फ्रॉम स्टार्टिंग टू टिल एंड सो दैट यू विल गेट ऑल द इंफॉर्मेशंस अबाउट इमिली डिकिनसन ओके सो हियर इट इज द टेस्ट टू दैट इज इमिली डिकिनसन द स्ट्रक्चर ऑब्जेक्टिव इंट्रोडक्शन द सोल सिलेक्ट्स आर ओन सोसाइटी दैट इज थ्री जीरो थ्री आई एम सेंग एवरी डे थ्री सेवेंटी थ्री इट वुड नेवर वी कॉमन मोर आई सेट दैट इज फोर थर्टी आई मेजर एवरी ग्रीफ आई मीट फाइव सिक्सटी वन बिकॉज आई कुड नॉट स्टफ फॉर डेथ दैट इज सेवन हंड्रेड ट्वेल्व my life had stood a loaded gun that is 751 rearrange our wife's affection 1737 let us sum up questions glossary suggested readings so here it is the objectives already you have known that every unit has its own objective so this unit has also its own objective so our primary objective in this unit is to give you some understanding of some of the most significant poems of emily dickinson so what are the poems of emily dickinson we will study briefly so here it is the introduction we have already told you that emily dickinson led a more or less secluded life in amherst massachusetts there is no wonder that she is preoccupied with the plight of an individual especially a woman brought up in new england death and immorality are two major preoccupations in the somber world created by emily dickinson solitude and introversion are two other preoccupations of the poet who published only seven poems in her life that too anonymously okay so solitude and introversion are two other preoccupations of the poet who published only seven poems in her life that too anonymously okay so at that time the women poet disguised their name so her poem was published and that was anonymously okay so you can see here it is the main key point solitude and introversion introversion means the person always think about himself or herself and is very shy and not moving towards or forwards or socialize to many people okay that is solitude and introversion are two other preoccupations of the poet who published only seven poems okay so published only seven poems in her life that too anonymously what do you mean by anonymously that is unknown the writer's name was hidden her poems have also published only her poems have also been described as her letters to the world as she did not give titles to her poems that are remembered either through the first line of the poem or through the numbers allotted to them in thomas a johnson's standard edition of the poems of emily dickinson okay as she did not give titles to her poems that are remembered either through the first line of the poem or through the numbers allotted to them in thomas a johnson's standard edition of the poems of emily dickinson in our selection we would focus your attention on 303 where the choice to live a completely secluded life has been affirmed in 373 the poet fancies what our life would be if she were to become a queen okay there is another poem 430 in which the speaker worked as if her body had wings but suddenly she lost her elan and turned into a beggar okay in 561 the protagonist tries to visualize the various phases of grief including death okay in 561 the protagonist tries to visualize the various phases of grief including death okay so the protagonist tries to visualize the various phases of grief including death 
सेवन हंड्रेड ट्वेल्व इज वन ऑफ द मोस्ट पॉपुलर ऑफ एमिली डिकिसन पोम्स वेर डेथ हैज बीन पिक्चर्ड एज अ मोस्ट सिविल पर्सन ओके सेवन हंड्रेड ट्वेल्व इज वन ऑफ द मोस्ट पॉपुलर ऑफ एमिली डिकिसन पोम्स वेर डेथ हैज बीन पिक्चर्ड एज अ मोस्ट सिविल पर्सन इट इज डेथ दैट ग्रेजुअली लीड्स द प्रोटेगनिस्ट टू द सेट स्टेटली मैंशन ऑफ इमोरलिटी इट इज डेथ दैट ग्रेजुअली लीड्स द प्रोटेगनिस्ट टू द सेटली स्टेटली मैंशन ऑफ इमोटलिटी ओके सो इमिली डिकिसन पोम्स हुआर डेथ हैज बीन पिक्चर्ड एज अ मोस्ट सिविल पर्सन इट इज डेथ दैट ग्रेजुअली लीड्स द प्रोटेगनिस्ट टू स्टेटली मैंशन ऑफ इमोटलिटी सेवन हंड्रेड फिफ्टी फोर इज ऑल्सो अ पॉपुलर पोएम ऑफ इमिल डिकिसन वेर द प्रोटेगनिस्ट विजुअलाइज हर यूनियन एंड एडवेंचर विथ हर लॉर्ड ओके सो सेवन फिफ्टी फोर इज ऑल्सो अ पॉपुलर पोएम ऑफ इमिल डिकिसन वेर द प्रोटेगनिस्ट विजुअलाइज द यूनियन एंड एडवेंचर विथ हर लॉर्ड The poet affirms that she cannot become an obedient wife. She has learnt more from life than she could have ever learnt from being a mere wife. She has learnt more from life than she could have ever learnt from being a mere wife. There is both an acceptance and rejection of the limitations of a conventional woman's life in patriarchal New England. She has learnt more than life than she could have ever learnt from being a mere wife. There is both an acceptance and rejection of the limitations of a conventional woman's life in patriarchal New England. Okay, so she has learnt more from life than she could have ever learnt from being a mere wife. There is both an acceptance and rejection of the limitation of a conventional woman's life in patriarchal New England. At heart, Emily Dickinson is a rebel, a dissenter. Okay, so here it is the main key point. You can note down. so that society was patriarchal society and there is both an acceptance and rejection of the limitation of conventional woman's life in patriarchal new england and emily dickinson at heart emily dickinson is a rebel a, a dissenter okay the soul selects her own society okay the soul selects her own society The soul selects her own society is a short poem in which Emily Dickinson presents the drama of her soul. The soul selects her own society is a short poem in which Emily Dickinson presents the drama of her soul. Okay, so what is the soul selects her own society is a short poem in which Emily Dickinson presents the drama of her soul. The narrator says that the soul selects her own companions, her own society. Then the soul sorts the door. She doesn't let in outsiders and intruders. The majority of people outside the door may appear divine and enchanting to the ordinary people of the world, but to the narrator, the divine majority does not simply exist. The narrator is different and is quite content to belong to the minority of one. The narrator is unmoved, that is not disturbed by the exclusion of the so-called divine majority. She also notices a chariot stopping near her low gate. An emperor may get down from the chariot and kneel before the mat in front of the narrator's small restricted kingdom. But the narrator is not influenced by the emperor's august presence. Okay, the narrator says that she perhaps the soul is from a large, ample nation, and she chooses one from the crowd and then closes. the valves of her attention to the outsiders in other words her atten- attention would be focused on the chosen one who is the chosen one god the bridegroom father the soul solitude guess who is the chosen one god bridegroom father the soul solitude so you should guess the soul selects her own society then shuts the door to her divine majority present no more unmoved she notes the chariots pausing at her low gate unmoved an emperor be kneeling of on her mat i have known her from an ample nation choose one then close the valves of her attention like stone okay this is the poem i am saying every day here 373 i am saying every day i am saying every day is a poem in which another drama is unfolded vividly the narrator one says that if she becomes a queen the other day she will do it in her own way and that is in her own style she will decorate herself a little 
she will also find that she is not an ordinary person she has become a burden nobody will be able to treat her super superciliously that is with cold disdain nobody will be able to say that the day before she was a beggar in the market people say that the court is a grand stately place she will be able to mix and mingle with the majesty who is the majesty the king of court she will also feel that her rank has risen high she can sing a song to please the majesty her life may be brief but she will mix and mingle with the majesty okay so she can sing a song to please the majesty her life may be brief but she will mix and mingle with the majesty there will be no cricket in the meadow and no bee will be able to equal her ascent there will be no cricket in the meadow and no bee will be able to equal her ascent she feels she feels that she must be ready for the change for the transformation she doesn't want to meet the majesty in her old gown she also doesn't want to be deemed a rustic and uncivilized barbarous fellow okay so here it is 373 poem i am saying every day if i should be a queen tomorrow i would i i would do this way and so i deck a little if it be i work a barbarian none on me been supercilious with this was she baked in the market place yesterday court is a stately place i have heard men say so i loop my apron against the majesty with bright pins of buttercup that not too plain rank overtake me and perch my tongue on twigs of singing rather high but this might be my brief term to qualify put from my simple speech all pain all plain word take other essence as such i heard thought but for the cricket just and what for the bee not in all the meadow one accost me better to ready than did nest morn meet me in our Ar- aragon my old gown on and the surprise dear rustics wear summon unexpectedly to exter to exeter so it would never be common more i said another poem so we will read it would never be common more i said so 430 it would never be common more i said is again a poem in which difference is celebrated the narrator one says that her plight is not common she is extraordinary she is unique she is different different from everyone it is morning the narrator has been in bliss she had much she has had much joy there was there has been a red glow upon her cheeks there has been a red glow in her eyes as well she has no need to speak it is so eloquent so palpable she has been walking as if she had wings her feet have been as unnecessary to her boots will be for birds she has also been bubbling bursting with joy she has been giving love to every creature she meet she has been showering gifts on the whole world suddenly everything changes changes for worse she loses her riches her wealth okay suddenly everything changes changes for worse she loses her riches her wealth there is a goblin who deprives her all deprives of all warmth all joy something fearful happens to her palace she becomes a beggar she tries to hold on to the sounds she grows after saves she feels wilderness all around her her golden times are wiped out she is able to see sackcloth hanging upon the nail she begins to wonder where our india made rocket is that is her riches her wealth 430 it would never be common more i said difference had begun many a bitterness had been but that old shirt was done or if it sometimes sort as twill upon the downest morn such bliss had i for all the years to give an easier pain i would so much joy i told it red upon my simple cheek 
I felt it polish in my eye, trust needles in his pick. I walked as wings, my body bore the feet I former used, unnecessary now to me. As boots would be birds, I put my pleasure all abroad. I dealt a word of gold to every creature that I met and doyed all the duet all the world. When suddenly my riches shrank, a goblin drank my dew. My palaces dropped tenantless, tenantless. Okay, my palaces dropped tenantless. Myself was beggar too. I clasped at wounds. I groped at saves. I tossed the tops of films. I felt the wilderness roll back along my golden lines. The sackcloth hangs upon the nail. The frock I used to wear. But where my moment of brocade, my drop of India. I measure every grief I meet. Then another poem we will study. I measure every grief I meet. So 561, I measure every grief I meet is a poem that shows the narrator's one preoccupation with grief that she finds in the world. She examines the origin and intensity of grief carefully. She also wonders if there is any grief in the world like her grief. She is not sure. If other people are able to endure their grief for a long time, she marvels at the old roots of her pain. She can't remember the date her pain began. She wonders if life will continue to be full of hurt. She also wonders if others would like to die so that pain might come to an end. She wonders if life will continue to be full of hurt. She also wonders if others would like to die so that pain might come to an end. She can see a smile on some faces, a faint, weak smile. It is like the light of a lamp that has very little oil. She wonders if there is any balm for their grief. She wonders if they would continue to bear pain. Perhaps their pain would touch infinity. Life is for the narrator bristling with pain. Death comes only once. It nails the eyes. She is comforted when she thinks of her pain and also when she thinks of cross. I measure every grief I meet with narrow, with narrow probing eyes. I wonder if it weighs like mine or has an easier size. I wonder if they bore it long or did I just did it just begin. I could not tell the date of mine. It feels so old a pain. I wonder if it hurts to leave and if they have to try and whether could they choose between it would not be to die. I note that some gun patient long at length renew their smile. An imitation of light that has so little oil. I wonder if when years have piled some thousands on the harm, they hurt them early such a lapse could have them any balm. Or would go on etching still through, through centuries of nerve, enlightened to a larger pain in contrast with the love. The grieved are many, I am told. There is various cause, death is but one, and comes but once, and only nails the eyes. There is grief of want and grief of cold, a sort they call despair. There is vanishment from native eyes in sight of native air. And though I may not guess the kind correctly yet to me, a passing comfort it affords in passing Calvary. To note the fashions of the cross and how they are mostly worn, still fascinated to presume that some are like my own because I could not stop for death. Here it is 712. The poem, Because I Could Not Stop for Death. Because I Could Not Stop for Death was one of the most popular and anthologized poems of Emily Dickinson. The narrator one says that she couldn't stop for death, but death was kind enough to stop for her. In the, in the carriage where she was traveling, there were two companions, Death and Immortality. They drove slowly. Death, the driver of the carriage, was not at all in a hurry. The narrator had given up her life of labor and her leisure as well. Okay, The narrator had given up her life of labor and her leisure as well. She did not because she did it because death was not frightening. Death looked civil and acceptable to the narrator. 
in this course of the journey they passed a school where children were playing with vigor they also passed the fields where the ears of grain were gazing at them they passed the sun as well the sun that was setting the narrator had a gown made of gossamer she also had a tippet around her neck and tulle made of soft fine silk so here is the main key point you can note down in a poem the narrator had a gown made of gossamer okay or gossamer she had a tippet tippet around her neck and tulle made of soft fine silk the uh, in other words she was attired like a bride they also passed before a house that seemed like a swelling of the ground the roof of the house was hardly visible the chronicle was in the ground centuries have passed from that day yes it seems it has been shorter than a day the narrator felt that carries in which she had traveled in the company of death was heading towards eternity the roof of the house was hardly visible the chronicle was in the ground centuries have passed from that day yet it seems it has been shorter than a day the narrator felt that the carriage in which she had traveled in the company of death was heading towards eternity they also passed before a house that seemed like a swelling of the ground the roof of the house was hardly visible the chronic uh, the cornice was in the ground okay so they also passed before a house that seemed like a swelling of the ground the roof of the house was hardly visible the cornice was in the ground centuries have passed from that day yes it yet it seems it has been shorter than a day the narrator felt that the carriage in which she had traveled in the company of death was heading towards eternity uh, the narrator felt that the carriage in which she had traveled in the company of death was heading towards eternity in other words it is only through death that the narrator attains immortality in other words it is only through death that the narrator attains immortality okay so the narrator attains immortality is a only death the poem is justly celebrated and is remarkable acceptance of death it also reminds one of kids dictum that death is mid of life 712 because i could not stop for death he kindly stopped for me the carriage held but the star sails and immortality we slowly drove he knew no haste and i had put away my labor and my leisure too for his civility okay so so we passed the school where children strove at recess in the ring we passed the fields of gazing grain we passed the setting sun or rather he passed us the dews drew quivering and chill for only gossamer my gown my tripet only tulle we passed before a house that seemed a swelling of the ground the roof was scarcely visible the chronics in the ground since then it is centuries and yet feels shorter than the day i first surmised the horses heads were to a eternity okay since then it is centuries and yet feels shorter than the day i first surmised the horses heads were toward eternity okay then she my life had stood a loaded gun my life had stood a loaded gun is another popular and anthologized poem by emily dickinson it is a poem in which the narrator one admits that her life has been a loaded gun it is an extremely striking image which perhaps conveys the explosive potential of the narrator the loaded gun has been kept in the corner of her apartment the implication perhaps that is that the explosive potential of the protagonist has remained confined to a small corner of her apartment she has had no opportunity to realize her potential in all its fullness okay she has had no opportunity to realize her potential in all its fullness one can also safely affirm that there is something dangerous something fierce about the protagonist one can also safely affirm that there is something dangerous something fierce about the protagonist 
okay but one can also safely affirm that there is something dangerous something fierce about the protagonist she is not an ordinary conventional woman of 19th century new england okay one can also safely affirm that there is something dangerous something fierce about the protagonist she is not an ordinary conventional woman of 19th century new england she is different the second phase of the poem indicates a kind of change in the protagonist lifestyle she is susan by her master she is also carried away from the narrow confinement of her apartment they live a life of freedom a life of pioneers they roam freely in excellent woods they hunt the doe when she speaks to her master her voice is echoed by the mountains when she smiles the whole valley glows it seems that as the pleasure of companionship burst out of her face it looks like vesuvius a volcano in italy full of pent up lava okay so it's a main key point you can note down so beautifully portrayal of the poet it seems that as the pleasure of companionship burst out of her face it looks like vesuvius a volcano in italy full of pent up lava when night comes and the day is over the ardent protagonist guards her master she acts like a vigilant watchman the protagonist says that she is a deadly foe to any intruder who may dare to harm her master if she can spot the guy she would release the trigger of the gun and shoot him dead the gun in the poem is more than a metaphor it is also literal okay so here it is the main key point which is the metaphor in the poem the gun in the poem is more than a metaphor it is also literal the protagonist knows how to wield the gun there is something of the pioneer and the frontier in this excellent poem the protagonist is such a deadly shot that the intruder has no chance to escape the protagonist is such a deadly shot that the intruder has no chance to escape he dies the protagonist is such a deadly shot that a intruder has no chance to escape he dies the protagonist is such a deadly shot that the intruder has no chance to escape he dies the protagonist however says at the end that he is more likely to live longer than her it would be better that he lives longer than the protagonist it is true that protagonist can press the trigger of the gun and kill like a pioneer but she does not have the tenacity and the power to accept death okay it would be better that he lives longer than the protagonist it is true that protagonist can press the trigger of the gun and kill like a pioneer but she does not have the tenacity and the power to accept death what the narrator wants to say is that only those who can accept death who have the power to die can redeem themselves one can see the poem 751 of from the core of the poem 712 accepting death calmly is a greater virtue than killing the foe 751 my life had stood a loaded gun the corner still a day the owner passed identified and carried me away and now we roam in sovereign woods and now we hunt the doe and every time i speak for him the mountain straight reply and do i smile such cordial light upon the valley glow it is as a vesubian face had let its place a throw and when at night our good day dawn i guard my master's head it is better than the elder dog's deep pillow to have shared to four of his i am deadly for non star the second time on whom i lay a yellow eye or a emphatic thumb though i than he may longer live he longer must most must than i for i have but the power to kill without the power to die though i than he may longer live he longer must than i but for i have but the power to kill without the power to die to rearrange a wife's affection okay rearrange a wife's affection is a poem in which the narrator has denounced the miserable plight of a wife okay so rearrange a wife's affection is a poem in which the narrator has denounced the miserable plight of a wife so rearrange a wife's affection is a in which the narrator one has denounced the miserable plight of a wife she has also portrayed that shared life of a single woman 
The society pretends to put in order, that is tame and domesticate a woman into the mold of a traditional wife. This is to be achieved by amputating ruthlessly her spotted hat. In other words, the throw sliffling her natural impulses. It is also to be achieved by marking her look like a man with a beard. There is that is not only her natural impulses are ruthlessly curbed, but even her natural looks are made to appear harsh and forbidding. Note the phrase freckled bosom perhaps refers to the weakness, weaknesses and foibles that a woman is likely to have. The phrase freckled bosom perhaps refers to the weaknesses and foibles that a woman is likely to have. The narrator urges her strong natural impulses to blast that is to feel a sense of shame. Okay? The narrator urges her strong natural impulses to blush that is to feel a sense of shame. The narrator urges her strong natural impulses to blush that is to feel a sense of shame. She also urges her desires as a woman to blush that is to feel a sense of shame. The compound of shame and guilt is due to the pressure exerted by the society in New England. The compound of shame and guilt is due to the pressure exerted by the society in New England. The reality, however, is that the protagonist, a single woman, has learned far more as a spinster than she would have learned as a traditional wife. She has had no experience of wifehood, that is domestic drudgery and slavery, yet seven years of solitary life as a spinster has taught her an unforgettable lesson. Her life has been such that love has not lived its socket, that is, love has not fulfilled her natural hunger. She also could not experience trust, that is basic for one's growth, as a result of which pain, narrow stifling pain, has been entrenched in her life. She has also no taste of constancy in love that would have given her sense of fulfillment. Her life has been such that love has not lived its socket, that is, love has not fulfilled her natural hunger. She also could not experience trust that is basic for one's growth. As a result of which pain, narrow stiffing pain, stifling pain has been entrenched in her life. She has also no taste of constancy in love that would have given her a sense of fulfillment. There has been no balm, no bedishing for the anguish and grief that has shared her. Life has been a terrible burden of her, although so far she has endured the burden triumphantly. She is not likely to be crowned, that is to attain fulfillment and happiness. Till sunset, that is till the end of her life, she would be pricked by thorns. It perhaps only after her death that she would finally be crowned. In other words, she would put on her diadem. These lines appear too prophetic because Emily Dickinson got recognition as a great poet only after her death. As a romantic poet, her poetry is a mirror of her apprehensions and hope. There is, however, a big secret in her life. It is big, but it is also a shot of bandage over her eyes. That secret, that mystery would never vanish. It would disappear only the day she would die and her tired flesh would at last have some rest. She would be then released from the fever, the agony and the prison of life. She would be buried in the grave and later on she, she would be united with him, that is the bridegroom. In other words, it is only after death that she would attain fullness and triumph. She could not endure to be a wife. She also could not be happy as a single woman in 19th century New England. That was the dilemma of Emily Dickinson expressed so vividly and transiently in 1737. So rearrange a wife's affection when they dislocate my brain, amputate my freckled bosom, make me bearded like a man, blush my spirit in the fastness, blush my unacknowledged play. Seven years of truth have taught thee more than wife would ever mean. Love that never lived its socket, trust entrenched the narrow pain, constancy to friar, wowarded, anguish bare of an anodyne. Burden burned so far triumphant, none suspect me of the crown.
for I wear the thorn till sunset. Then my dead am put on. Big my secret, but it is bandaged. It will never get away till the day its very keeper leads it through the grave to thee. Okay. So here it is. Let us sum up. Emily Dickinson led a large secluded life in Amherst. in new england solitude led to a life devoted to reading and writing she had however a number of literary mentors she had however a number of literary mentors her poems are however her letters to the world she had published only seven poems in her life they were anonymous publications it was only after her death that her poems were published on a large scale she made her reputation as one of the most intense and romantic poet of new england her poetry is largely a poetry of rebellion and confession okay so this is all about emily dickinson the text to already i have discussed so please please like share and subscribe this channel so thank you thank you viewers here it is the question